Good evening, everyone. Here we are once again, Monday Night Must See TV here on Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to the Hudson Valley Squares. Nick Franco, Ryan Scow, Steve Keeler, Chris Allo, and of course, I am Pete Pardo. Welcome to another rant series. Today, we've got a pretty cool episode. This topic was actually given to us by Mr. Keeler there from Rock Fantasy. So today, we're going to each talk about some albums by bands that we love that we kind of just like ignored and never really got into for whatever reason, maybe because uh, the album came later in the career, maybe because we were so busy concentrating on other albums in the discography of these artists. But for whatever reason, doesn't mean we dislike these albums, but maybe we just never caught on to them. And maybe now we really dig them a lot, but back in the day, we just, for whatever reason, just didn't get into them, right? So uh, uh, we're gonna start, uh, start at the bottom here today. How about Mr. Allo? Then Mr. Keeler, Mr. Scow, Mr. Franco, and then myself. So, Chris, kick us all off. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll start from the bottom. Uh, this record uh, came out in 1990, and uh, I was kind of excited to get it, and uh, but it was missing one of their the key members. And I thought it was an okay album in 1990, uh, but then there, was a, then there was a reunion of this lineup, in uh, i don't even know like five six years ago my buddy sean and i kept going to see uh venom inc and uh i would I, after the first time i re-listened to the prime evil record by oh, venom wow. and um, it, it's a really good record uh you know at the time i was really bummed that chronos was gone and they had some guy named al barnes that was venom was a four-piece and uh venom was it was a non-entity in america at the time but, uh, geez, I guess I didn't listen to it for uh, probably 25 years. But when um, Demolition Man, a Abaddon, and uh, Mantis got together in, in Venom, Inc., uh, I gave it another spin. And I was like, wow, this is really good. There's some good material. I, I, we met them at uh, Roseland and had, had them all sign the, the album. And, uh, you know, it's, um, it's really good. I like it better than, um, you know, some of the other uh, Venom Kronos albums. Uh, so... Uh, that's my first pick, uh, Prime Evil from 1990. Good choice. Just a note on that, I can remember, you know, of course, Prime Evil was one of our local bands, and, and yes. at the time they were still a band. I remember, I don't know if it was guys in the band, but I just remember the grumbling, like, oh, why are they using our name for an album? Prime Evil. Well, if, I, if I remember right, too, when they reunited, they wanted to use the name Prime Evil, which is what's similar to the Dio version of Sabbath did using the name Heaven and Hell. But of course, the New York Prime Evil had something to say about that. Okay. And so they just Venom Inc. Empire of Evil for a little while. Yes, right. Empire of Evil. But I think this was in between that. I think it was, I thought I could be wrong um, because mm -hmm. I thought they were, because it was uh, Mantis and Demolition Man were Empire of Evil. And yes. then, yep. then they did a gig in Europe where they brought in Abaddon, and then they were like, hey, we can make money with this. Uh, so that's, I thought that's where the prime evil name, where they were going to, then they, they were going to do it uh, with some kind of weird spelling. And, uh, but anyway, I, I don't want to take up yeah, time. Yeah. Go, go get this record. It's pretty good. If you like that. Well, so anyhow, I'm switching the gears to heavy duty here. We're going to 1989's Rush album, Presto. And I was a Rush fan, one of my favorite bands. And, uh, I did lose track of Rush in this time period. I think I was just caught up too much in the world of metal. And I saw this album and I saw the album cover with rabbits on. I don't think I really gave it any a bit of a chance. And I kind of did completely fall out of listening to Rush in this time period. I actually went back and got into Rush. And actually around 2010, I started going to see them every time they came around heard a couple tracks and I started revisiting a lot of their uh a lot of their catalog and I I love this album like let's do it all the time I like to pass I like chain lightning show don't tell of course the red tide I just like it's it's I think it's a good album and I it was one I overlooked I, I did That's the same thing Steve now as I overlook thing I'm now I'm realizing because Pete was like the other day he's like you can find a bunch of you look through it Halloween's another band. I overlooked a bunch of stuff. So if we do another episode in a couple of weeks like this, I can add some Halloween because I just got thinking about that. Sometimes you'll go to a show and you haven't listened to a band for years and you start rediscovering like, oh, that album's not bad. Well, that's oh, a great yeah. album. I never listened to it because 
they let out something in your, or you change your style of listening. But yep. rush presto. There you go. Well, I, li I like your comment, Steve, uh, lo lost track. That's a good way of looking at it. Sometimes you just kind of, there's so, there are so many bands out there. You just sort of, sometimes some just, you know, drop off out of your, you yeah, know, out of your vision. Yeah, definitely. And like 89, it was more like we were grinding into the heavier stuff, some death metal and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, well, it's a new Rush album. Yeah. Cool. All right, Ryan, what do you got? All right. So, uh, this, this is probably a situation unique to me growing up, but when I started getting into, a lot of metal and a lot of classic rock when I was like 15, 16, 17, 18. Uh, I heard all these bands at once. So I wanted to get all of it at once, but I didn't have a lot of money. You know, obviously, in this case, most people in the younger. So I couldn't buy everything I wanted. So unfortunately, I'm going to say the emphasis usually went up. I had an extra 20 bucks and I had a choice between albums. It usually came down to a metal album. So there was a lot of great 70s bands that I got some of their catalog. And for whatever reason, I just didn't get again for years. And one such case was... I was really into the first two Bad Company albums when I was a teenager, and I just never bought any other albums beyond those first two, Self-Titled and Straight Shooter, for years. And probably about 10 years ago, I finally went back, and I got the third one, Run With The Pack, which is a great album. And uh, I've gone back. Some of the, the 80s stuff, and they got a little softer, you know, not really big, but they have a couple other really good 70s albums, and this, this is a great album. I should have bought this 20 some years ago when I was a, you know much younger. It's just as good as the first two, but you know, I don't know why I stopped at the second one, just how it was. But I'm glad I uh I changed mm -hmm. my good, solid classic rock album right there. Very good album, yeah. That's very good album. And yeah, everybody always talks about those first two. That's, that's all everybody talks about. Very <laughs> underrated. Of course, album. you know, Ryan, you're a lot younger than someone like me, and you weren't around when those albums came out new, of course, and listening to music, you probably weren't even born. So, you know, yeah, you, you know, there's a lot of that can go on, even with me, someone my age, missing some of those classic rock albums in the 70s. So. I think, Pete, you're right, though. Like, I always heard people talk about the first two. I'm like, I guess those are the only good albums. And I was listening to them like, no, this is this is really good. I don't know why I overlooked it, but, uh, you know, I made a point to fix that in later years. Yep. Good choice. All right, Nick, what do you got? So my, my album that I'm picking first uh, came out on May 17th, 1988. Uh, and in those days, my introduction into metal was very much contingent upon my older brother and what was in his room and what he had. So I might be the only person who was introduced to Judas Priest with the album Ram It Down, which I ever since then, I've always seen this album get pretty much not slagged completely off. But like a lot of people don't like it or they, you know, it's just never mentioned as a priest album that, that most of the fan base really cherishes. Um, and I listened to it a lot when I was like that age. And I, even then I knew that the Chuck Berry cover wasn't very good, but uh, <laughs> I, I've actually, as I've, I've been getting more and more into Priest as I've gotten older. I kind of went backwards and I was realizing that I really enjoy this album. There's a couple of songs I don't like on, I don't like, I think Monsters of Rock is kind of boring. I don't like Love Zone and the cover is terrible, but Blood Red Skies is so cool. Hard to uh, even heavy metal as as you know maybe you know it's typical you know 80s oh, it's good song. It's a good song. And the, to say nothing the title track is one of my favorite priest out songs but it's really good and the guitar t uh, tone on that album especially when i was young was massive to me i was coming from guns and roses and molly crew and then in the same year i discovered metallica and judas priest and iron maiden and uh that so that album i've gone back and listened to it ram it down i think it uh is an overlooked album i think it's it's pretty good Judas Priest. Cool. I also have Priest on my list, but I'll, I'll save them for a little later so we don't get two priests in a row. It's good. Uh, so this was my choice for my first choice. Uh, Deep Purple Come Taste the Band. It's one of those albums that, you know, back in the day, big Blackmore fan. I was like, well, Richie's gone from the band. I don't know how much I need to listen to this. Uh, Back in the day, I wasn't really that big into Tommy Bolin. And, you know, we all know the band broke up after they released this album. So I was kind of like, eh, I really don't need to bother with this album. They've got enough other albums. You know, I, Machine Head, Made in Japan, sure. In Rock, Fireball, and then, you know, Perfect Strangers and Burn and Stormbringer, all these great albums. And I just never really bothered with this much. Till about like maybe 20 years ago when I finally gave this album another chance. And I was like, you know what? This album is really fucking good it's really good it's it's kind of funky it's got some great guitar work the songs are memorable Bolin plays his ass off Coverdale and Hughes sound great and 
lo and behold, I have now a deep, it's almost like rediscovering something for the first time, but many, many years later, it's like, wow, there's another great album in the deep purple discography that I now can enjoy, which all those years ago, I just kind of basically like, eh, I didn't really bother with. So come taste the band. This is my first selection. Makes a lot of sense what you just said. And, you know, even with me, I was in the, of course, grew up with classic rock in the 70s. And then when I had the metal store, I was really, rock fancy was really all about metal for a long time. And then I started a playlist for the back room years ago when I opened the smoke shop. And I wanted to be like a really classic rock vibe. And I started discovering and finding a lot of albums that I really didn't listen to back then. So yeah. it was a reawakening, like I said, and finding some stuff. Uh, you never listened to the full album, maybe, or just heard a couple of songs from. Yep, exactly. All right, Chris, what do you got? Back to you. Oh, back to me. Okay. Uh, I got into the Scorpions in the in the eighties, like uh, many people, with uh, uh, Love at First Sting, and then I got the the records like right or that right around there. You know, uh, Love Drive and um, uh, Animal Magnetism, and uh, you know, I knew that they had the records from the seventies. But for a while, um, I, I didn't get them uh, until I got uh, in the 90s. Then I got the, one of the Uli John Roth records, and I was, like, shattered. I'm like, oh, my God, these records are better than the records in the 80s. Oh, yeah. And then, oh, yeah. But for the longest time, I never got uh, the debut album from, which I think is from 1972, uh, Lonesome Crow, uh, which, of course, features... I think Michael Shanker was like 14 years old yeah. and uh, eventually I got it and I was like, holy shit, this record's great. <laughs> I mean, it's very different. Uh, you know, it's still hard rock, but it has a, has a psychedelic edge. Uh, it's, cool. it's very different from the Uli John Raw stuff. Very different, of course, from the more commercial 80s hard rock. But man, still a still a great, great record and absolutely worth checking out. It's basically their Kraut Rock album, right? Or their Space Rock album. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very different. different. Oh, yeah, it's very cool. I and you know what's really sick about that? I mean, yeah, Shanker was like, I, I think it was 15, right? Or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's otherworldly guitar playing on that album, though, right? Yeah. I, mean, I couldn't even make grilled cheese at 14. And this guy's got ripping ass guitar solo. It's nuts. <laughs> totally the same. Yeah. I could barely do the microwave. <laughs> even make real cheese <laughs> that's a great line <laughs> oh good choice all right steve back to you <laughs> well if anyone is a fan of this band you can tell what my number two pick is i not, not that they're in order but this is emerson lake and palmer pictures at an exhibition and loved emerson lake and palmer but you know what i never had this record uh back in the day like i i you know i started with brain salad surgery got Tarkas, I had Works, I had the first album. And for some reason, I never got this. You know, I'm talking eight track days. And wow. I, don't, I don't know if anybody on here is old enough that, that had eight tracks and listened to eight tracks. All right, Chris Al is old enough. And Pete's, oh, Pete's old enough too. And uh, I just never had this album. And I was just listening to it last, uh, like a week ago. I had the record going, I had a few drinks. I was sitting out in the house. And I said, man, I, and that's where I kind of came up with an idea. I said, I wonder, hey, Pete, did you want to do something like some albums we overlooked by bands we love? And this album, I think, is, I mean, it's, it, it's just a great album. It is a live album. So, and it's, you know, it was a step of them putting classical music into the rock and roll zone. And so, Steve, you and I are on the exact same page with this album. I did the same thing. Uh, I, basically was into and bought all their other albums except for this one that, i mean yeah. what, what scared us away from this album is it because it was like a cla a rock interpretation of a big you know famous class yes. is that why i mean i think i don't know i don't know but when you listen to it i mean it's not that much different no it's, it's, other not. it's the thing and I, it's think perception. I mean yeah promenade and uh and the hot the baba yaga yeah and the curse of baba yaga it's just great stuff yeah i think now you listen to it now it's no different than anything else but i think our perception no. of what it was for some reason then. and it was a big mover for them it's just i don't know yeah i never even heard that it was much. also i didn't have that much money when this stuff was all new and, you know i was getting eight tracks or some vinyl 
and I didn't have money to buy everything. So maybe when I, That's you know, big deal, but... and sometimes it was hard to go backwards too when you were buying something and you'd say, well, you didn't have the album from before that. And, you know, it was just something like that when, you know, we're making 50 bucks a week or something back in the day. Yeah. Well, you would have been, you would have been better spending your money on that one than Love Beach. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, I ended up with Love Beach too. Uh, <laughs> people like that album though, don't they? No. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, turn the page. And we're right. not talking about Metallica. Anymore. Mr. Scow, what do you got? All right, I just pulled this off the shelf. I just thought of this. So uh, obviously, very big black metal fan. And there's a Norwegian band that started off as black metal and has since gone on a roller coaster of uh, many sounds. That band is over. So years ago, I was obviously big into the first two over albums, first three over albums, uh, Berg Tat, uh, the second one, whose name I'm not even going <clears> to <throat> attempt to butcher, and uh, Natrin's Madrigal. First, and oh, first two black metal, or first three, and the second one is, uh, well, yeah, it's like an acoustic kind of folky. And then they just whoop, gone, left metal behind, and they put out all these other albums, uh, many of which I like. And for years, and I've been getting into the newer albums for a long time, I neglected this one, which I had to check. This came from 2000, and it's uh, Perdition City. And this is a very, it's like the soundtrack, it's like a neo-noir kind of gothic. It's, it's, it's almost like an electronic album. Like It's not metal. Uh, I almost don't even classify it as rock, but it's very cool. It's very moody. It's more of like a movie soundtrack thing. Amazing album. I listen to it all the time now, but I don't know. I just overlooked this for many years. And I went back. I'm like, you know what? They've always been a weird band. I'm expecting this one to be weird, too. And, you know, people have always talked it up as like a really good over album. And I don't know why I just overlooked it for that long. But, yeah, this is a uh, this is a really, really good album. Not metal, but really good. Really good over album. So, they are incredible. And Everything their new album, too. Like they, they almost sound like like the new stuff. It's almost like Depeche Mode. It's yep. like this kind of like synth. Like they just every they, they just change themselves constantly and they do whatever the hell they want, you know. And bless them, you know. It's it's cool. Saw them a couple of years ago. Like me and uh, Nick saw them in a uh, Irving Plaza in Manhattan. They only played new stuff. Like anybody who's like, oh, I want to hear the, you know, they don't play any of that stuff anymore. They play like Frankie goes to Hollywood covers. So they do whatever the fuck they want. And it was it was a great show. Incredible. And, uh, they didn't play anything from that album though, but it was only the newer stuff. But uh, mm-hmm. yep, this is a. Uh, I recommend that one if you're into that kind of stuff. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> Definitely. All right, Nick, back to you. All right. So um, obviously uh, growing up, massive, massive, massive Slayer fan. Uh, and then, you know, the 90s, which kind of made everything nuts. I kind of got away from them for a while. Um, and then obviously when I went back to them, I loved their first like, you know, three, three or four albums. But I found that like, I got back into uh, not so much South of Heaven and Seasons in the Abyss. I'll still once in a while, but the album that a lot of fans don't really like because they went off into a completely different direction after that, but an album that I feel should get more respect is Divine Intervention. I almost picked that one. Yeah, yeah. This one had full of drums. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this this thing, like the guy carved Slayer in his arms. Um, This album uh, has a couple tracks that are eh. But the, you know, Killing Fields, what an unbelievable, the drum, the intro of that song and the whole thing, uh, Ditto Head, super fast, almost like, almost like old school hardcore punk. Circle the title track, yeah, the title track of Divine Intervention is one of the most like miserable fucking songs. Like it's just, it, it's so unlike them and, and it, it works so well. Uh, Circle of Beliefs, a great anti-religious tirade. And 213 about, uh, what's his name there, Mr. Dahmer. Um, I, I think Divine Intervention should uh, should get a lot more respect from Slayer fans. And, uh, that's one I definitely go back to. You know, uh, that's not an album I overlooked, so I could not add it. I probably listened to it a ton when it came out. I listened when it came out, but yeah. I didn't really appreciate it. Yeah, 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 sure. Cool. All right. My choice is uh, Blue Wish to Cult Mirrors. Good one. That's a good album. I didn't overlook that one. When I, uh, well, I, yeah, I totally did. So, uh, you yeah, know, I got yeah, into yeah. Blue Oyster to Cult with Cult of Source Erectus and, um, and then Fire of Unknown Origin. And then I went way back and started, you know, buying and listening to all the stuff from the beginning. And sure. this is one of the, you know, I picked this up like everything else, right? But this is one of the ones that never fully grabbed me. You know, a lot, most of the Blue Oyster Cult albums, you know, you, you can't help but be just enraptured by. And uh, I always kind of dug it but never really listened to it much. 
until more recent years. And I, th I, I still don't think it's like top shelf Blue Worcester Cult, but there's some really good music on here. Really good stuff on here. You know, Dr. Music is a lot of fun. The Great Sun Jester, uh, Envy is terrific, right? Uh, you got uh, I Am the Storm, Lonely Teardrops, You're Not the One I Was Looking For. I think it's a pretty strong Blue Worcester Cult album. And mm. uh, it just, I guess, kind of got overshadowed for me with a lot of the ones before it and a couple of the ones after it which happens right it's good. but the strong catalog like these guys have it's it's easy it's that was uh that was between Baltasaurus and fire unknown origin right that's where that album falls right before cultasaurus okay yeah before so cultasaurus I, I saw that tour a couple of times my first uh album i bought from plc was agents of fortune and i oh, bought it at like at lloyd's department store and it was like when it first came out so. That was my first. So that shows a little bit of our age difference. You, were, you came out of Cultasaurus, and what was that like? Eighty-one. Uh, Cultasaurus was what eighty. This was seventy-nine. Yeah, he had Spectres, Agent of Fortune. So yeah, so you're about two years before. Cult Cultasaurus is a tour that they did with Heaven and Hell, on, right? The Black. Yeah, right. yep. yeah. And of course, I got to see that one. <laughs> right. All right, Chris. Back to you. Oh, okay. Back to me. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I liked what you guys were saying. Uh, I, I don't think uh, older, younger fans can appreciate uh, the fact that, you know, years ago, you know, you, you didn't have music at your fingertips literally for free, you know, and we, we were all in the same boat. You know, you had to buy what albums you could. And, and I know, like, with Bad Company, I was like, oh, yeah, I don't have all those Bad Company records. For me, Bad Company was a, a greatest hits band. And when I, when I first got into Motorhead, I got, you know, the leather bound No Remorse in like 86, I guess. And that to me, Motorhead was a greatest hits band. Eventually I got all the records, um, but I never really paid that much attention to Another Perfect Day. Uh, everybody always kind of shit on the, on the record. And, you know, I gave it a couple of things and I was like, okay. But then, and Motorhead in the, in the 80s always used to, um, play the same sets like over and over again, the eighties, the early nineties. And then in the, in the two thousands, uh, they really started mixing it up and they really started digging deep into this record, you know, playing, uh, shine and dancing on your grave. And I, like, awesome. you know, I, I got to give this record another listen. And I was like, Holy back shit. The funny this farm. Record, this record's great. Back at the funny farms. And I'll, Die really oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a great fucking album. So, it is a yeah, great album. Really, it's really a strong record. Uh, I like it better than Iron Fist. Um, so uh, that's that's my pick. Uh, another perfect day. I, I, never I, it. I saw that tour at the Chance, man. Uh, wow. Yeah. I was wow. really drunk. I, I almost picked uh, that. I almost picked it for, for this. And um, when I saw Motorhead in Sweden in 2005, they played Another Perfect Day, the title track. And I remember even then Lemmy was like apologizing. But yeah. uh, he was like... Everybody doesn't like this one. He's like, fuck them. Crazy. It's such a, it's such a good <laughs> album. Played it. It was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Here's a Brian Robertson was on guitar. The, the, the guitar playing, the whole album's fucking great. I love the great. shit out of it. So many people back in the band. day refused to listen to that album just because Brian Robertson was in the band. It's like, oh, he's he's too much of a clean guy, you know, for Motorhead. And I'm like, he was like the biggest bad boy in Thin Lizzy. I mean, next to Yeah, Clark. I going to say, he had the reputation back then. <sighs> People are fucking weird. Yeah, I know there's always stories of him wearing sh like gym shorts on stage with them and stuff, but <laughs> yeah. but look, looking back as a record, yeah, it's it's re I think it's it's really a, a solid record that that I overlooked for many many years. Yeah, absolutely, good choice. Yeah. All right, Steve, what do you got? My next overlooking uh, <laughs> album is behind me. It's yes, <laughs> going for the one. Oh, my choice. And 1977, <laughs> and for some reason. I never listened to this album. And of course, I had Fragile, I had the Yes album, I had Closer to Close to the Edge, and I yeah. had really songs, which which was one of my gateways into Yes. I remember some a friend of mine turning me on to Yes songs. And I remember like when that came out, that that winter of that year, I that was all I listened to in my car was Yes songs just over and over again. But I never listened to this album till later on. I might not listen to this album until like the 2000s. And I actually got to see Yes a few years ago where they did this in its entirety. And of course, I knew Wondrous Stories and a couple of the tracks off at the turn of the century. 
solid yeah turn of the century and uh parallels awaken it's another great track oh so, awaken is amazing yeah yeah, yeah. And so i kind of overlooked this one it's a great album yeah i i had the same thing i actually was going to do that and i had the same opinion i stopped at relayer for some stupid reason probably the same reason for bad company <laughs> And of course, well, I didn't stop that because I kind of got into them, and then I it was like, it's like like Chris under like Chris explained, you weren't able to listen to all this stuff in 1977 because there was no way of listening to it unless a friend had the album, or you listen or heard it on a radio station. There was no internet, no YouTube, no nothing to say oh, let, or Spotify or. That's anything. all recent. Yeah. That's only in the last couple of years that it's been the case where you can like, ah, how does that sound? You know, you can listen to Spotify. Yeah, you can listen to anything on there. Pretty much. YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Digital. So, Steve, is that is that the same guy from the uh, Hemispheres album? He's right before he Maybe goes. Maybe that's why I didn't listen to it. It's like, ah, it's a naked guy on a cover. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> same guy. Yeah. It could be him. You know, it could be. It could be him. I don't yeah. Know. So Ryan, yeah. you got a replacement uh, now that Steve. Yeah, I do, and uh, I'm actually going to go with the same band you just did, Blue Oyster Cult. So. Uh, I heard Blue Oyster Cult for the first time. I forget how old I was. I was in high school, and uh, it was the movie Heavy Metal, so the song from the soundtrack, Veteran of the Psychic Wars, which is an amazing song. So I got uh, sure. Fire Room on Origin, that album's from. And then uh, I heard all the Blue Oyster Cult in that vicinity. I went back to their 70s stuff, bunch of 80s stuff. But for whatever reason, uh, I never listened to their 1998 album, uh, Heaven Forbid, for a long time. I don't know why. I just Maybe just because it was so much later. I don't later think I've ever heard it. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, I don't know if I'm like, I just kind of like assumed that like, ah, they're not still going to be good. This is years ago. I'm like, they're not still going to be good. And then uh, I was actually uh, the band uh, High Spirits and Dawnbringer, Chris Black from those, that band, told me, he's like, you never heard Heaven Forbid? And I'm like, no. And he's like, you better fucking fix that yesterday. So I went and bought it because I trusted his taste. And this is a really heavy, really, really good album. It so opens with uh, See You in Black, which would be the heaviest song Blue Oyster Cult ever wrote. Wow. Uh, Moon, which they still play in every concert great song yeah it's a really good album just full of really good songs and uh as soon as i bought it i'm like you know my bad i don't know how i overlooked this for so many years but yeah, this was in 98 you know so kind of after their heyday but you know they were still kicking some uh kicking some serious ass at the time so, and the new one's good too so and it kind of sounds like this i'd say so they're still in that mode but yeah you know i mean that the problem with that album is like it was on a crappy label you know that was what cmc international right is that what that was on yeah, yeah, CMT, yeah, I mean, they did a terrible job of promoting their stuff, and that album so cover much, is pretty dreadful, right? So, so much that yeah. I never even knew about it. I don't think if yeah, I did, it's a I really got one or two album. copies in back in that day. And yeah, no, Steve, you'd like this. It's yeah. really it's a good, solid, heavy album. Very to check it out. Oh, cool. Yeah, good choice. All right, Nick, back to you. Okay, so I'm gonna. Uh, switch a little gears to um, a more, uh, I guess, a band that became more proggy as they got as they went along. Um, there's few bands from metal that have like morphed as much as um, Anathema from England. And uh, I got into Anathema in the mid to late eight nineties, uh, and they were switching from a doom metal band into more like Pink Floyd, Radiohead sort of territories. And I think they did it very well. But one of the albums that um, I listened to it when it came out and then I sort of drifted away from it was um, a fine day to exit this one here. Yeah. yeah. And I think like, you know, when you, when you, I just remember reading a lot of the, the metal magazines at the time were like, some people got it, like people that were okay with, cause it's very, it's a very effervescent, like a lighthearted, but thematically sad and heavy album. But the, the music itself was much more laid back and they were in their like radio head phase. I'm not a Radiohead fan, by the way, by any means. I know people love them, but so maybe that's why I drifted away from this album. But I definitely have come back to it since. Um, I think it's a beautiful album, and I think uh, it should probably get a little bit more respect in the you know in the discography. Um, Temporary piece, the ballad at the end is uh, just one of the nicest melody lines you'll ever hear in a ballad, and uh, the meat of the album is, is really good. It's very catchy and. Um, I think it's it's uh, even maybe a tad heavier than people at first gave it credit for. What do you think, Pete? You you like that album, right? I do. I, I you know I think the problem with that album is like the the folks who still love the early early stuff yeah. probably were already dismissing them by then, and then yeah. the latter period stuff has gotten so much attention. So folks who kind of jump 
yeah. on board then are probably missing out on that one and the earlier one. So it's kind of sits in a weird place in there. Right. Yeah. It does exactly right in the middle. Yeah. But I think it's good. I think it's good. Yeah. No, I agree and I've come you. back to it. Yeah. I agree with you. All right. So uh, my last choice of the day is uh, point of entry by Judas Priest. Oh, cool. Oh, well, that tour too. A fine <laughs> record, right? But at the time, I mean, I was all into British Steel, Screaming for Vengeance, Defenders of the Faith, Hellbent for Leather, Stained Class, and I just was kind of like, yeah, this is not quite as heavy as the rest of the stuff, so I just never listened to this at all. It's, cool. it's, it's, it's it, not. What it's it, good it is. It is. Um, a lot of good songs on here. It's Granted, it's not as heavy as some of the other albums around it, but... I just, I always owned it. I mean, I bought it and uh, I just kind of sat on my shelf or in my LP stacks mm -hmm. and I listened to everything around it and just never bothered with it. And, you know, in more recent years, I'm like, you know what? Damn solid album. Uh, what year just, is that? This was 81. 81. 81. 81. Same I, definitely, I definitely saw that tour, uh, point of entry tour, because I remember having a shirt and I saw it on the fairgrounds and I believe Iron Maiden. Yeah, the, the Deanna version of Maiden opened up on that tour. It was wow. Maiden, Point of Entry, and Joe Perry Project. Oh, wow. was which was a, back then they kind of threw stuff like that together. Which you would get my there. left nut to see that show. My left nut. Yeah, I was, I, was <laughs> I didn't even have a nut at the time. As opposed, was, to, as opposed to your yeah, right one dropped yet. <laughs> I was five or so. He's more, more attached oh. to the right one. <laughs> are we doing it around or are we good here? Uh, what do you think? Does everybody want to hold up one more or you want to save it for another episode? Uh, I can do it. save it for another one. Yeah, all right. Sounds good because I don't know if we can squeeze it all in. So, all right. So, everybody watching, uh, if you like this, this was fun. I have more I can do so we can do this yeah, uh, maybe in two weeks. We'll come back for part two in two weeks. Does that sound good, guys? Yes. Yeah. All right. Good. All right. So we'll have a different one for you next. We have another Steve Keeler idea for next week's topic. So tune in next uh, Monday to see that. And then we'll do part two of these overlooked albums two weeks from tonight. All right. So uh, anybody want to plug anything while we got, we got a couple minutes. Oh, well, rock fantasy. Come visit my shop. If you're local, if you're not, you can check me out at rockfantasy.com. We have a website and we sell stuff from the store. Also new releases or vinyl or CDs or whatever you'd like to buy so check me out at rockfantasy.com middle rock town. fantasy in downtown middletown new york if you're local come check us out we're open there you go they're awesome anybody else side projects fun stuff chris oh i got well, nothing chris oh, i got three minutes to talk about ecw wrestling in the 90s <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, well, since Chris is not going to mention it, I will plug it. So stay tuned right after this show. Uh, Chris Allo and I are going to be giving you another edition of the Monsters Den, more werewolf. Oh, that's right. That's right. Coming up Good point. right after oh. this. Exactly. We're going to so, have yeah. monsters like Wolfman and stuff. Yeah. Wolfman Jack. <laughs> Wolfman Jack, yay. <hey. laughs> All right. All right. So everybody visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube. All the damn time. If you like what you see here, please hit the Ko-Fi link below in the uh, in the uh, video description. Buy us a pint of beer, a coffee, a tea, whatever the hell you want. Uh, we got our, we got our links to our merch store. You can buy some Sea Tranquility shirts, hats, hoodies, all that fun stuff. And uh, we'll see you guys later on. All right. So for Ryan Scow, Nick Franco, Steve Keeler, and Chris Allawine, Pete Pardo. See you next week, everybody. Take care. Rock and roll.